All right, this is chapter six. It's firewalls and VPNs. Do y'all use firewall at home? Anybody? I'm willing to bet every one of you do. Well, at the end of this week, you're going to be able to test if you do or not. So, we're going to learn all this stuff here. So, technical controls are essential. You know, did I tell you guys the scenario here where I says, you know, if you were going to build a bank, would it be better off to take an old 7-Eleven quarter to a bank? Did I tell you that in here? I learned something yesterday. On Air Depot, you know where Arby's is on Air Depot? Directly next to it's that credit union. That used to be a chicken restaurant. So that blows my whole theory out of the water. You can literally take a chicken restaurant and convert it to a bank. I'm like, seriously? Yeah. It's not a, how did they... I don't get it. <laughs> Maybe there's no money there. I don't know. But I heard that yesterday. I'm like, they literally took a chicken restaurant, converted it to a bank. That's crazy. Okay. So technical controls says are essential in enforcing policies and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, access control. How are we going to let you into the system? Now, these next couple topics here, mandatory access controls and discretionary access controls, they're used every day. They're kind of important. They're actually on a lot of certification exams, and you'll hear about them in many classes, so it's not like this is the only time you're ever going to hear about them. Mandatory access controls says user data class uses data classification schemes, which we'll see here in a second. And discretionary allows users to control permissions. Okay. There's actually a decent picture here. Okay. So we have non-discretionary and discretionary. Discretionary is when you decide what you want to do. You as the user want to decide how to secure your data. Not normally the best way to do it. Okay. Non-discretionary, we could have mandatory access and also role-based. Let me give an example of what that is. When I worked at Tinker, first of all, whenever you set permissions, say we're setting permissions on some file server somewhere, do you think it's a good idea to give permissions based on username or based on groups? What do you think? I got Taylor, works at Tinker. How, I mean, would it be best if I want to give Taylor access to some files, should I give her access individually or give her access, you know, add her to a group and give the group access? What do you think? Individually? Well, actually, it's best to go group. Let me explain why. Okay. We'll pretend Taylor just got hired here at Rose State. She works in IT services now. She's a domain admin. So if we do it individually, we're going to have to go to every machine on Rose State campus and give Taylor access to it. What happens when Taylor leaves? Or maybe Taylor doesn't leave, so we're not going to delete Taylor's account, but she's going to move into finance. How are we going to, we're not deleting her account, so it's not going to automatically remove it from all machines. So then we're going to have to go back through every single machine on campus and remove Taylor from it, except for the finance office. If we do it by groups, we can add Taylor to the administrator group, and they give the administrator group to all the machines on campus. Then when Taylor switch positions, we take her out of administrator group, put her in finance group, done. Much easier to be done by groups. But I will tell you, a lot of people do it by user because it makes sense. When I worked at Tink, I was in software development. We, we wrote software. And we had, whenever we finished software, we had to give them two copies. And all, you know, one had to be stored on site, one had to be stored off location. But and, and the ones that were stored on site when we were working on it, we had to have permissions to edit the files and stuff like that. And they would always give individual permissions. I'm like, that's a bad idea. Because it, I, I could very easily sit there and see who, who's in the administrator group. Oh, Taylor's in there. But I couldn't very easily see what she has permissions to if I had gone through all of Rose State campus. I want to have permissions there and permissions there and permissions there. I would have had to query every machine. So I kept trying to tell people, you don't give it by user because then you're going to have to, okay, what does Taylor have access to? It's very hard to figure out. So it's, a, you know, it's kind of a different. And you don't, you're going to talk about this a whole bunch more in different places. But permissions that are controlled by users, not always the best idea. First of all, do users even have a clue what they need? 
we all think we know what they what we need, but we really don't know what we need. It's very hard to know what you need nowadays. It's like, obviously I eat too much. Obviously I don't need as much food. Yeah, but I do because I eat all the time. Okay, so you know, according to my doctor, you know, I don't need alcohol. According to me, I think I do. So you know, it's kind of like a user. You don't always know what you need. Okay, complete that the other day. You need to stop drinking. I had to go in for a blood test. He goes, I want no alcohol for an entire week. I'm like, who do you think you are? You're just a doctor. <laughs> he also said, no, no Tylenol products. I'm like, okay, whatever. So, yeah, user is not always the best. Okay, let's talk about identification here. It says, mechanism whereby unverified entity seeks access to resources. Okay. We're going to identify something. Anybody got a Surface in here, Surface Pro, whatever, you know? Does it use your picture? Yeah. You like that? It, I, I, it's kind of, you know, I, 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 I'm... I didn't like having the setup. Right, I didn't like that either, because, yeah, because then you got two of them. But I'm trying to use mine. So I, initially I had Windows, just Windows. And I, I wanted to get used to a Mac, so what I did was I forced myself to use the Mac for everything for a couple months. I'm really good with a Mac. So now I'm trying to force myself to use the Surface for everything. It's difficult. My Mac is so much easier. The Surface is fine, but what bothers me is I get a keyboard with it, and if I accidentally hit the screen, it's touch screen, and I'm way over somewhere else, and I'm just, just having issues with it. So identification on the Surface actually uses my face, which is kind of good. Um, but there's other ways. There's a... Identifiers can be um, composite identifiers, can be elements, can be codes, can be numbers, can be whatever. Okay, here at Rose State we have student IDs. That was our identifier. Okay, mine happens to be very low because what they did is I had a weird number. Then when we got this new PeopleSoft system, they imported everybody into it. I guess somehow they did it, and I got number seventeen. You guys are what, 030-something or other, and I'm 17. I don't know how that happened, but it's very low. But so normally we have identifiers. Oh, did you all see the news yesterday about the Real ID Act? You all know what the Real ID Act is, don't you? Our driver's license suck here in Oklahoma. For three times, you know, many years now they've been telling us you will, you're will, you not Real ID compliant, so you're not going to be able to use them in airports anymore. Actually, the federal government offered Oklahoma money to fix the problem, and Oklahoma says, nope, we're not interested. We're stupid. Well, yesterday, I was actually watching the Senate vote yesterday live on Channel 9 at the Senate chambers. We're finally implementing Real ID because the government says, you're screwed. You are not going to be able to use your ID for nothing. Now, I have a global entry. I have a password, so I'm fine. But for the rest of you normal people, you'll be out of luck. But what they're doing is they're giving you, the user, the opportunity to pick which kind you would like. So would you like a real ID compliant ID card that will work for military bases and airplanes and everything, or one that isn't? Why? I mean, why? You know people, wait a minute, so the real ID, I, didn't, I don't even know if there's a cost involved. I'm assuming there will be. So do you want the real ID that costs $18 or the non-real ID compliant which costs $16? What do you think most people are going to pick? The $16. $16. What do you mean I can't fly on the airplane? Yeah, go buy a $150 passport. So I was like, why would they give them the option? I heard that yesterday. I'm like, seriously? You're a little, and they're like, yes, and we were going to actually mail them out. There was this big discussion in the Senate chambers. They're like, so you're going to mail the non Real ID compliant identification card to their address. Then they will have to come and pick up the real ID compliant one. Then a few minutes later. I don't know. Okay, so, so you're actually going to mail them both. And they're like, if they ask, they're going to mail them both in the same envelope. I'm like, oh. what's this big old discussion about if you order the real ID compliant, you're going to get both. But it's like, how are we going to get it to you? It's like, what the? Some of the comments on there were like, are they literally discussing this? <laughs> yes, we want to mail them this one, then have them come pick up this one. It's like, wow, it was crazy. But identification, kind of a big deal. Authentication, the process of validating. What uh, Yes, they are, you are going to have to pay $5 more just for it to be real ID. There's the problem. Everybody's going to say, oh, I'm going to save five bucks. I don't want to get real. Then now, 
Huh, I got a job on Tinker. Now I can't get to work. Oh, wait a minute. I want to fly somewhere. No, nope, it ain't happening. That's just the dumbest thing known to man. I, I, I saw that. I'm like, you know, my issue is, it's funny because I commented on this about a year ago when we were being told we're not Real ID compliant. And here's my opinion on the whole Real ID thing. This is Ken's opinion. I moved here from Connecticut, okay? Connecticut, we go to the DMV. We pass the test. We get a driver's license. What is this tag agency crap? When I moved here, I lived on the southwest side of town, 89th and Penn. You know where I went and got my driver's license at? Kenny Skaggs Tag Agency slash Vacuum Cleaner Store. It's still there to this day. You're literally selling a federal I mean, uh, an identification document alongside a Hoover. I mean, does anyone see a problem with that? I mean, you, that, that's not good. That's like saying, uh, welcome to Tinker Credit Union. Would you like to cash a check or buy a pizza? I mean, that's stupid. You don't, <laughs> you don't sell IDs in a vacuum cleaner in the same store. Either you got damn secure vacuum cleaners or unsecure driver's licenses. And some guy's like, you're an idiot. You know what you're talking about. I'm like, dude, look up Kenny, Kenny Skaggs. That's it. We're going to do it right now. I'm gonna show you. It's literally there. I looked. It's still there. Oh, it's also known as Kenny Sags Vacuums. So let's go to Google Maps. Where, where's the Maps link? There it is. I'll go here. Okay, here's the outside view of it. Vacuums Tag Agency. Let's move down a little so we can get a better picture of it. Tell me that's not a tag agency that sells vacuum cleaners. <laughs> that is the stupidest thing known to me. Who decides this stuff? It's like... I, it, it baffles me when I see these things. I'm like, that is... And everyone's like, you know, we need tag and cheese because the DMV can't handle the workload. Just think if we had maybe three DMVs instead of one, three locations, and maybe we had 50 employees working at each one, we could handle the load, and we wouldn't need 350 tag agencies. But, you know, it's just me. Okay. I have a question. Like, I went to the tag agency, and I, I was charged like $500 for the tag for registering your car? Yeah. yeah. For, for what is that money? Because I have a driving license in the UK, and I never had to pay that amount. Uh, I, well, what it? I mean, if you register in Oregon, no tax. Texas, no tax. What it is, think if you go to the store and you buy something for a dollar, it costs you a dollar eight. Yeah. There's a tax on buying a car is what it is. There's a very small registration fee that actually dwindles down each year. But when you first buy a vehicle, they're actually charging you an excise tax on that vehicle. So that's why when I was in the military, my first car was registered in Oregon. Yeah. You can do it. You can actually do it through the mail in Oregon. You can drive to Texas to register a car, and there's no tax. I know. Yeah, you could have. But, yeah, it's, it's crazy. So, okay, authentication. This is the process of validating your identity, okay? It could be a password. It could be a passphrase. It could be many different things. We talk about all kinds of weird things in here. Okay. It says it could be something you have. Maybe it's an ID card. Maybe it's an ATM card. Maybe it's a smart card. I used to uh, take care of a, a, a law firm down in the Oklahoma Tower. Short Wiggins, Margo, and Butts was the name of the law firm. And I had a smart card to get in there. And it was nice. It was a very powerful one, which means I could just leave it in my wallet. And I could literally bump my butt up against the door and it would unlock it. Because I was always carrying in computers. And it's like it was a smart card. You just swipe it and there's something. And it works. Okay. You ever notice outside of our doors on these buildings, we have those lock things outside? Those are for the new licenses we or IDs we will probably never get, but we'll be able to just walk up there and swipe your ID and the door on lock. But it's not really important for you students. It's really important for us. Like, I'm literally the first person in this building every single day. So, you know, it'll help unlock the door. Okay. Could be tokens. Okay. Something you is, something you are. It could be, you know, it says relies upon individual care. It could be biometric. It could be whatever, okay? Authorization is the matching of the authenticated entry to a list of information assets. Now that we know you really can do it, what do you have access? What are you authorized to do, okay? Okay, you can have it for each individual user. Can you have a member of a group? We already talked about those. Or it could be across multiple systems. 
So when I log into my computer in the morning, I can automatically get into my email. I can automatically get into the network shares so I don't have to log into each one. They mention something here called authorization tickets. That's actually what happens. We're using something called Kerberos, which we'll see in a minute. But when I log in in the morning, it gives me a ticket. Then my account basically presents the ticket every time I try to access something. Okay. Accountability. Here's an issue. You know, We want to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Sure is that all actions on the system, authorized or unauthorized, can be attributed to an authorized identity. We want to know who you are. That, uh, it's funny, that, that show hunted. you got to watch it because some of the stuff they did was literally all we teach in cybersecurity. It's like, well, well this guy has been in, involved with the police 13 times, he says. So he was a member of a gang, and now he's a defense attorney. So he knows how to, all this stuff works. So they're trying to track him and everything. What it is is there's an FBI guy, a CIA, an NSI, all these retired people, and these people are on the run. They come up to you and say, you got one hour, go. And you have one hour to get away. Then you have to hide for 28 days. And they're trying to find you. So they're hunting you. But uh, uh, this guy is, so they're, they're trying. The dude rents a car. You're like, seriously? You're going to rent a car. So they rent a car. So they're tracking him. They find the rental car. And they're following the car. Car stops at Enterprise Place. And they go in there. And they're like, so this guy, red-haired guy here just rented the car. No, but he, but he did, she's like, what did he tell me? He was supposed to say, thank you for following my trail to the wrong location so that I can get away the opposite direction or something. I mean, the guy was really good. He had somebody going to rent a car in his name so that, you know, they couldn't find him. It's just like, it's crazy stuff in there. But kind of relates to accountability. You know, what, what are you doing? Because it said that guy rented a car. Obviously he didn't. So it was, it was funny. So it says, most often accomplished by means of system logs, database rules. Uh, when I worked at Tinker, uh, I worked in the network shop there for a while. It was, they kind of forced me there. Say, so I had a basically my master's degree at that point. Actually, I had my master's degree at that point in networking. I had a lot of experience in networking. I ran my own company in networking. So the captain in charge put me in the networking shop. They didn't want me there. But he said, he put me there to... Uh, fix things. Well, one thing they came up to, the, I don't know if you know how Windows Server works, but Windows does not have what's called an uptime log. It does not keep track of how long it's been running. Linux does. So Windows, really, the only way you can figure out how long the machine's been on is count the, re the logins. Okay? So there's actually a log entry 605 and 609 that every time a system reboots, that log entry is generated. So we can figure out, okay, if there's a 605, 609, that means the system rebooted. We figure if it rebooted for five minutes, then we can calculate the amount of time that the, the, the system was up. So I go into the server. I said, okay, I need to see your log so we can see how many times it's been rebooted. So the log is very short. I'm like, where's the rest of it? Oh, the log keeps getting full, so we just keep deleting it. I'm like, what the hell? You can't delete that stuff. What? I mean, they're like, yeah, we, we delete it every morning. Wow. I could see someone trying to break into Tinker. Oh, yeah, we delete logs every morning just for the heck of it. It's like, wow, that's bad. Okay. But logs keep track of file access. Uh, another funny thing was, again, they kept testing me. Because, like I said, the captain put me there. And they're like, well, if you're so smart, you solve this problem. Well, this guy got in trouble in the military and he got kicked out. Well, then, remotely, he kept accessing a computer on base. And it was really freaking them out. Nobody could figure out what it was. So they come in there one day, all right, Ken, since you're so damn smart, Sergeant Jackson's in the commander's machine right now. Like, he is? Yep, he's in his machine remotely right now. Like, okay. So he says, how do you know this? So they pull it up, and they look at the logs. They actually have the logs going. So look, right here, the calendar was accessed by Sergeant Jackson. And it's the commander's calendar. And I says, no, it doesn't say that. Like, yeah, it does right here. It says Sergeant Jackson. I says, no, I, technically that's the computer name that's accessed in the calendar. So what happened to Sergeant Jackson's computer? Oh, it was newer, so we gave it to the commander. It says you never renamed the damn machine. You know how you got a machine window machine, then you got a description. They called it the commander, but then the description says Sergeant Jackson. So I said, no, that's just the commander accessing his own calendar. 
but since you didn't change the description, it's showing you Sergeant Jackson, but it's really the commander himself. And like, what? So we went up there. I says, look, right here, description, Sergeant Jackson. Like, oh. So it was just like, logs are good as long as they're correct and as long as you know how to read them. So I did that so many times, and they're like, oh, okay, fine. Leave it to alone now. But uh, so the logs record all that kind of things, but you have to know what they record, how it's recorded, so you can really determine what's going on. Okay, can have many uses as well. I used to, uh, when I ran my mail server at my company, I kept text logs. I kept, my logs were about 500 megabytes a day of strictly text. I kept about 30 days worth and I would delete them because really, by law, I did not have to keep them at all. I kept about 30 days worth. You know, Google never deletes a single log. You can literally go back. We had the... Um, Postmaster General here one few years back speaking to the Cybersecurity Club about mail fraud. And there was a bank, I don't remember the bank's name, I figure it was Chase Bank or something. There was like, you know, a whole bunch of these banks all got hit with an anthrax attack. It, it was fake, but they all got hit and they were trying to track down who did it. And after much work, he explained the whole process. They found out that it was this one specific machine in the computer lab at the University of Arizona that searched all these bank names on the same day. And that's how they found the guy. All through a Google search. So now you know, every single thing you search on Google is never deleted. Whatever you're searching is stored forever. That's why when you search on Google, it can give you those, the, the, the whatever, the suggestions you never know if some of those darn things are good. It's like, that's exactly what I was going to type. How do they know that? Because they're, 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 they're accumulating all this data. But yeah, Google deletes nothing. So. Yeah, it's like I was searching something on, on the web the other day, and then I went on Google Maps to search the same thing for location. And it came right up. And it came right up. Yeah. Like, it's, it, it's crazy. And um, it's good. Even if, okay, you know what like incognito mode is? Hold on, let me show you. If you don't, let me show you. So I'm, I'm in the Google page right now. I can go down here and I can say new incognito window. Ooh, now I'm hidden. No, I'm not. It's not going to store anything locally. In other words, there will be no cookies. There will be no web browsing data. Google's still storing this. <laughs> so don't think by being incognito, Google can't track you. They still store everything. So it's, it's just amazing. So, all right. So, sorry. A lot of tears. Like cool yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, i tell you a very handy feature for that is I use Gmail, and I have like five accounts. I have uh, my Rose State account, and I have my uh, Park University account, and then I have my... Um, what's the other one I access uh, all the time? I, I have a bunch of them. But I want to access my mother-in-law's account, but I don't want it to be stored with mine so they're linked together. Incognito is perfect for that. Then I can check hers without it linking it with mine, and it's wonderful for that. Biometrics is a approach used based on human measurability factors. Okay, fingerprints, retina, eye scanners, hand, all that stuff is in there. And they show pictures of it here. Uh, a bunch of kids or students went from University of Tulsa to work for, work for the NSA. And one thing they always did to people there, actually one of the students was telling about it a few years back, is <coughs> when you first get a job there, you're kind of like an intern figure the lowest of the low. So what they normally do on a Friday is say, all right, it's coffee and donuts day. We need you to go out and get two gallons of orange juice. So they send the interns out to run to the store and buy two gallons of orange juice. Well, they actually have a, I forget what, the, a, a man trap there at the NSA. They actually weighs you. And if you are outside of, I think it's seven pounds of your prior weight, it locks you in there. Guess what happens? We have two gallons of orange juice. You're out. That happens all the time, and then they have to get a supervisor down there to find out what's going on, and then yeah, it happens all the time. So, but uh, biometrics. I mean, touch ID on my phone. I can't believe how well that works. It works really good. But my son, way back, I had. Remember when they first came out with fingerprint readers? There was a a Microsoft one, and there was a, a couple different ones out there. But I had the Microsoft one. It was kind of this gel. It wasn't gel, but it kind of felt like gel when you touched it, and it worked really good. 
My son, brainiac he was, he walks up with a white piece of paper, puts it on top and pushes down on it. The gel kept my fingerprint in it. The moment he put the white piece of paper and put a little pressure, it actually read my fingerprint off the gel and it let him right in. I'm like, damn it, that's not even right. So, but I actually works really good on here. My fingerprint reader on my Surface sucks. I can't use it at all. Does yours suck? I don't know what it is. Like, okay, fine, you registered. Then you're like, okay, I'm sorry, we couldn't read you. I'm like, you just registered my fingerprint. It doesn't work for nothing. So, I mean, that's in the little external keyboard thing. But uh, all kinds of, I mean, you see a lot of TV shows with this. Uh, Mythbusters, you all see when Mythbusters did fingerprints? This guy, company, was like, oh, yes, we have the best fingerprint locks in the world. They go by the frequency of the blah, 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 and all this other stuff. Well, the Mythbusters guys, they, they made Jamie touch a glass, and they took a picture of the fingerprint. They blew it up really huge, took a paint program, cleaned it up, made sure it looked perfectly, shrunk it back down, and got in with a piece of paper. And, the, and they're like, I thought you said it worked with the temperature and the and the frequency differential of the ridges. And they're like, that's bull. It just works with a picture. So it's funny stuff. Uh, but a facial recognition's come a long way. Google Pictures, anyone use Google Photos? You know, it's free, by the way. Google Photos backs up all your pictures, unlimited amount, totally free forever. It automatically recognizes people. Facebook does the same thing. You ever notice that on Facebook? Is this a picture of Billy or Bobby or whoever? It's like, how is it doing that? It's just some amazing stuff they're starting to do. Okay. They talk about which one's best. Uh, you know, they're just different. Okay. Architecture schemes. There's something called a trusted computer base. Also, the Rainbow Series. And the Orange Book is probably the most popular. You might read about it someday. But they have these models of things they're supposed to do. And how do you make things work better? And how to secure things? And talks about policy enforcement and all that stuff in here. And storage channels, just all kinds of different things that talk. It's not critically know about all that now. It just it wouldn't hurt to read it. And they have the common criteria. They have all the different you know the Bell Lotrajo. How about the Chinese? Y'all ever heard of the Chinese Wall? Anybody know what the Chinese Wall is all about? You know, I mean, not, you know what the Great Wall of China is. We all know what that is. Why was it built? Does anyone know? Keep the Mongolians out. Keep the Mongolians out. But if you look at the Great Wall of China, every so often there is these huge arches of totally open space. Does that make any sense whatsoever? What it was really do was to keep them out, but it really funneled the Mongolians through a small area so they could be killed. If you have an entire wall, they're probably going to climb over it. But if I got this whole wall, but there's a hole there, I'm going to go through the hole. Chinese can wait on the other side hole and kill them all. And prevent them from climbing over. I mean, it's a great idea. So, and, and that actually, you know, with some of this stuff, um, it's kind of like, say I'm working in a law firm. If I'm working on the, a car dealer fraud case or something i don't know maybe chevy's suing ford so if i'm working in a law firm it'd probably be important that the person working on the chevy case couldn't see the data from the ford case and so on and so forth that's kind of what these models pertain to and you'll learn a whole bunch more about that when you get into ism okay and again i'm not an expert in all these there's the the chinese wall just designed to prevent conflicts of interest between two parties you know to keep people separated like the Mongolians. So, yeah, it wouldn't hurt to read over these because you will need them. Actually, there's probably test questions on them too. Just, I'm not going to go into more depth on them. Firewalls, that's the fun stuff. Prevent specific types of information from moving between an untrusted network and a trusted network. Right? Could be a separate computer, could be software, could be hardware, could be whatever. We had a couple different types here. We have packet filtering. Application layer, circuit gateway, MAC filtering, and hybrids. We're going to talk about each one of these types. Packet filter, we look at a packet coming in. What a packet is, is data, is information. I search Google, the information from Google come back in, comes back in packets, okay? Has a source and destination address. So maybe with a packet filter, I can filter based on source, or based on destination, or based on port, or based on direction, or based on protocol, or whatever. 
is really easy to do. And actually, I can show you some pictures here. I think it's a couple slides. But here's an IP packet. So you'll see we have the length of it. Um, down near the bottom, you'll see source address, destination address. We can sort by that. We can sort by all kinds of different things. There's a UDP packet. We can sort by or TCP and UDP. We can sort by sequence number, acknowledgement number. See, the way the Internet works, we have TCP or UDP. Both of those use IP. Okay? So if we're using TCP or UDP, you, what's the big difference between those there? Does anyone see it? TCP, like email uses TCP. So Correct. So it reinsures all of the data go, comes across. Correct. Um, it's what's called the connection oriented. We make sure it gets delivered. Uh-huh. Right. And, um, like, for instance, like live streams or you're streaming something on the internet, um, it uses UDP. Right. Perfect. Now, if you look in here, see this whole sequence acknowledgement thing? The way the internet works is uh, I'm going to send Taylor some information. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call Taylor. Hey, Taylor. She's going to say yes. So she's going to acknowledge my call. Then she's going to say, hey, Ken. I'm going to say yes. So I'm going to acknowledge her reply. And then we're going to start. Basically, it's called the three-way handshake. I send her a synchronization packet. She sends me an acknowledge packet plus a synchronization packet. Then I acknowledge her, and then we start communicating. That's and then, then we start using sequence numbers. We start incrementing. That way, if the packets get there out of order, we can put them back. Okay. So you see, all that's inside of TCP. UDP doesn't have that. UDP. The point if you if you're watching a, a video on Netflix, and you miss one packet. Whatever, who cares? Can you imagine watching Netflix and one packet gets lost so your video stops? And it has to start all over from the beginning again to get that one missing packet. No, you just want to watch it all. And UDP is now good enough quality. Our, our networks are reliable enough now that really UDP is just about as good anyway. Okay. Uh, packet filtering, the packet comes to it, and if it's not allowed in, we send it back. I know I got a picture of something in a second. Here's the sample rule, but I actually gave you some real rules. Okay. This is actually some rules from our router. The first rule says access list 101, that's just what our list is called. Deny IP 192.168.0.0. Now, what this is, is denying any packet coming in with the address of 192. And remember what's special about 192? Talk about that in this class. It's a private address. Did I cover private addresses in here? I don't. I teach so many classes. I don't remember. But 192, 172, 10, all those are private addresses. They're internal only. So this rule says if a packet's coming in from a 192 address, deny it. Because if it's coming in, it shouldn't be a 192. 192 is already in. It's a private address. So that's what that rule says. The second one says permit TCP any host once you know one six four blah 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 equals www. So what do you think that one does? Anybody? What's www? Yeah, it's web traffic. So this says this is the destination. This is the source. So any packet. I, I'm sorry. This is the source of destination. So any packet coming from anywhere. Going to this guy on port 80, let it in. So if you want to surf the internet, let it in. Okay, this is our inbound list. So any packet coming in with port 443, what's that then? What are you, any ideas? That's SSL. That's secure web, web browsing. That's a little lock on it. Any packet for this address with SMTP, what would that be? SMTP, anybody? Email, simple mail transport protocol. So these are some different rules allowing email, allowing secure web browsing, secure or unsecure web browsing. I tell you, I installed the the wireless at the all the not all but a lot of the Buffalo Wild Wings around here. I did the one in Moore, and I did one in Edmond, I did the one in Stillwater, I did a couple different ones. But when I first set it up, I was like, okay, so what do we need to do? I said, what do you want your customers to be able to do? Surf the internet, check email. Makes sense. 
So I gave them internet. I gave them secure internet. And I gave them email. Didn't work. They wouldn't know why. It took me about 30 minutes to figure out what the heck am I doing wrong? So what I did was I, rather than type in a name, I typed in an IP address. What we're missing is DNS. DNS is the whole name resolution system on the internet. So when you type in www.google.com, let me show you. So if I do NS lookup, name server lookup for www.google.com, it gives me those numbers. So whatever you type in Google on your web browser is going to translate it to one of them numbers. So what it was, that translation was being blocked. So I had to allow port 53, which was DNS. Does anyone know why there's so many numbers for Google? Just because they're big? Check them out. They move. Like, look at the top number. See how it keeps changing? It's called round robin. Can you imagine if everybody that went to Google all connected to the same machine? It died. So what it is, Google has all these machines, they're all configured at different addresses, and every time someone requests something from Google, they get another address. So what is there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 Google machines in this region. So that means in probably Oklahoma City, Tulsa area, there's 16 of them. This is probably running out of prior Oklahoma. So yeah, it's round robin. Every time we do this, we get a different address. We do it quick enough, you'll see they'll actually go up one by one. You notice like the 48 just moved all the way up. Yeah. So it's called round robin. So you'll learn about this in your network class. Hopefully. All right. So packet filtering. There's three subsets of firewalls. We have static filtering, dynamic filtering, or stateful. Static is requires that the filtering rules be developed and installed, just like the ones I just showed you. We made them, we put them in. Dynamic, it allows firewalls to react to emergent events and update the rules to deal with it. Machines are getting smarter. Firewalls are getting smarter. They can like, whoa, we're getting a lot of something. We need to stop it. We also have state pulses. Keep track of each network connection between internal and external using a state table. What that means is we allow nothing in. But if you go out, so Taylor sends a request to Google, if that request is in response to Taylor's request, It'll come back in. But if Terrell didn't request anything, nothing can come in. See the difference? Stateful means replies can come in, but we don't. if it's not a reply, we're not letting it in. So it's really the better way of doing it. There's another example. It's a state table. So here, someone at the 192 address on port 1080 sent something to 1010. There's still another internal address, but obviously this is a sample. Going on port 80, so they're obviously we're requesting something on a web server. So. All right. Application firewalls is uh, frequently installed on dedicated computers, also known as proxy servers. Proxy servers aren't used as much as they used to be. Um, proxy servers, what they were in the past, was a machine that would store or cache information. Say, uh, when I first took care of uh, Taylor Valve Technologies, it was a company way out on uh, 74th and Council. They uh, sell parts for oil wells, drilling rigs and all that stuff. They sell valves, technically. Well, back then, this is years ago now, believe it or not, there was, an inter there was a lot of stuff happening before half of you were born. But we had one 56K modem for the entire company. That was it. But what we did was we had a proxy server going. So if Taylor requested a FedEx page, and she was the first one today to request FedEx, the request to go out to FedEx, it would come back, and a copy of the result would be stored in our proxy server. So what's your name right here? Brian. Brian? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then Brian, a few moments later, types in FedEx. First thing Brian's going to do is ask the caching server over here, or the proxy server, has anyone been to FedEx lately? And we're going to pull it straight from the proxy server. We're not going to actually go out to FedEx and get it. Makes things so much quicker. Think about news. News pages, yeah, they change, but they don't change every two seconds. So proxy servers were real good. You could also filter. You could go in there and say, you know what? Like when I did that work up at uh, Meridian Technologies, filter out anything to do with 
pornography or sex or anything. And I, I told you that story up there, didn't I? I was up there teaching one day, and this guy busted into our room. And basically, our internet went down. They totally blocked our whole network, and it says, someone's surfing boobs. What? The problem is, if you think, <laughs> I don't know who was surfing what. But can you just imagine someone mistyping Bob for boob, and then the entire internet goes down? But that's what it could be used for. Whoa, someone said the word boob, and they killed it. I was like, what the? <laughs> I still remember that day, and I'm like, I don't know. He's like, who's surfing boobs? I'm like, I mean, you're teaching a class about computers. I don't know, but it was crazy. But proxy servers are not used much anymore. But the reason is they, they were used a lot to speed up traffic. Nowadays, our Internet's fast. Do we really need to cache that much stuff? My caching settings on my home router are set at zero. I don't need to cache anything. Because I got a 150 meg connection. I mean, it's going to refresh in point one second anyway. But they are still good for content filters. Okay. So it says addition filtering routers can be implemented behind proxies to do other stuff like that. And even when I worked at Tech, it was funny because I had all these proxy servers. And what you do is you configure your web browser to use a different port. So you basically port 80, which is the web browsing port, was blocked. So then what you do is you configure your machine to go on 8080 or 8081 or 8082. I wonder if I can, let me. Let me see if I can find that. It's got to be in there. It's been so long since I played with this. Tools. I hate using Internet Explorer. It's just easier to find it in. Get out of here. Tools. Internet options. It's going to be under... Is it content? No, it's connections. Land settings. Proxy server right here. So I could go in and say, use, you know, actually we have one in a row state. What's it called? I haven't used it in so long. Pretend that's it. And what we do is put this at 8080. That's the normal port. So what that means was I can no longer surf the Internet on port 80. All my traffic would go through that machine on port 8080. Then that machine would go out to Google, to whatever, get my results and return it to me. Um, what we use it for here on campus, I don't know if it's still there, I haven't used it in a while, like uh, we block incoming and outgoing traffic at Rose State. I used to have to access a NSA website on a specific port that was blocked. So what I did was I would set my machine to go through the proxy server, then the proxy server could go out and get the information they needed. But I worked to take it was funny because they had all these proxy servers, 8080, 8081, 8082, 8083. But the people who worked in the land shop, we knew if you put it to like 8089, it bypassed all filtering. So it was kind of like everything was filtered, but if you put this one specific address in there, I mean, it was like 8089 or something. It bypassed all filtering. So it was like, oh, that's kind of handy to know. But I'm assuming they don't do that anymore, but you never know. Okay. All right, uh, we have MAC later filling. This is designed to operate at the media access control layer. That was your MAC address. Okay. Maybe only certain people can get in or out. In my home router, you can very easily set up MAC filtering with your Wi-Fi at home. You should, be, Depending on your router, you probably go in there and let certain MAC addresses in. Okay. All right, and there's an example of the OSI model and how it all works together. Hybrids could have parts of everything. Uh, Maybe it does content filtering, and it does packet filtering, and it does port forwarding. It can do all kinds of stuff, okay? You could have two separate firewalls. You could just have all kinds of different stuff, okay? And let's see. Best configuration depends on three factors, what you want to do with it, to implement it, and how much money you got, okay? So I already talked about packet filter. Bastion host is a sacrificial host. It stands for a sole defender of your network. Basically, it's a machine you set up that you expect to be destroyed. We're actually setting up one this week, a router that I use for one of my forensics projects. I'm setting this router up to be connected. So, in other words, to be you can connect to it from the outside world without any security whatsoever. But the entire point is for students to exploit this router. Kind of like a bastion host. It's a machine I'm expecting people to break into. But that router is not going to be connected internally at all. 
So from the outside, you're going to connect into the router, but you can't get out of the router. So it's kind of like you're stuck there. Okay. So Bastion hosts normally have two network cards. They can be used to filter traffic, to do whatever you want with them. Okay. Yeah, all this kind of stuff you talk again in networks. You talk about it again in network security. You talk about it in a lot of different places. Okay, screen host says packet filtering with separate dedicated firewalls such as an application proxy. So maybe we're going to do packet filtering, but we're also going to filter by application. See, the problem with packet filtering, I could take a, a bad packet or a bad something, a virus, break it into a whole bunch of pieces and get it through your firewall. Then send one on the other side, and now i got a, something. Um... Application proxies normally assemble the whole thing before it lets it through. So, just a couple different ways that they work. Okay. And I'm not going these in gory depth at all. Demilitarized zone. Did they show us a picture of that? Maybe here. Here's the inside. here's the demilitarized zone. So we got some servers that on the left side of the network, the untrusted external network, we let certain people into the servers. Maybe our mail server, our web server, whatever but don't allow them into the inside network. For that, they have to go through some internal router or a proxy or whatever. Okay. Like in my house, when I ran my ISP, I had a router, so the outside world went through my router into all my servers, but then had a secondary router to get into my home network. So it was kind of like a de demilitarized is not quite as secure. Okay. Here's another example. Talked about that. Sock servers. I don't know anyone who's using those anymore. It was used along with proxy servers years ago. It was used with um, like LimeWire type stuff. It was used with streaming music. But no, it's not using it. It was calling me from Rose State. Hold on. Hello? Yeah. Uh, possibly. Don't cancel it yet. I'll send an email out when I get done with class. It's okay. I'm, just, it's okay. I'm up here lecturing right in front of my students talking on my cell phone. That's pretty handy. I'll come see you when I get out of class. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Associate Dean want to cancel some classes. All right. But SOC servers, I don't know anyone's using them anymore. They were used with chat. They were used with streaming. They were used with all kinds of stuff. Not really used much anymore. So select the right one. The big issue is money. I'm assuming you guys at home either have a Linksys router or a Nikkei router or it came with your cable provider or something like that. Okay. What technology do you want? Packet filtering is what you guys would probably use at your house. The other ones cost a lot of money. Okay. So it says select the file, number of factors. Really, the cost is probably the number one for you guys. All right. Um, Policy configuration and, you know, setting up the rules like I showed you examples of, that stuff takes a very long time to do correctly. I, I've been working on that for years and we still make changes. I actually had William make changes on the router today because we're always tweaking it, adding this, removing that, or changing that. or So it's, it said it's complex and difficult. Yes, it literally takes forever. It's a never-ending process. Okay, best practices. All traffic from the Trustic network is allowed out. A lot of places don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. What that means is, so from inside Rose State, we should let everything out. Well, what if it's a virus? Do we want to, What if we have someone spamming everybody, sending out junk email? Do you really want that to leave your network? No, you want to stop it before it gets out. Firewall device is never directly accessible from the public. Well, I'm setting one up that is, just for a school project, but normally you wouldn't want that to be available. Okay, SMTP data is allowed to pass through the firewall. That's email. Again, we talked about that a little bit already. ICMP, anybody know what ICMP is? ICMP is ping. It's like the connectivity thing. I think we, we, did, we played with it a couple weeks ago. But ICMP is denied. Telnet should be blocked at all times. The one I'm setting up, Telnet's enabled. Again, I want the students to use it. I want the students to exploit it. That's the whole point of it. So. When web services are offered outside, since traffic should be blocked from reaching internal networks, so we want a DMZ or something like that. Okay. 
All data not verifiably authentic should be denied. Okay, we don't. Okay, I guess. Okay. Let's see. Well, there's some different ports. Port 7 is Echo. 21 is FTP. 20 is FTP as well. 23. There's actually a file on your computer. We'll show you another day that you can actually see all that. Yeah, I want to make sure we get finished. Here's an example. Okay, we have the source port, destination port. So that top one says, so anything from 10, 10, 10, 0 on any port going anywhere, deny. Okay. External firewall inbound interface. Okay, so that's the inbound. So yeah, if this is the inbound rule, so something coming from 10, 10, 10, 0 should not be allowed in. That makes sense. Let's see. The second rule. So coming from anywhere. Well, they've done that. Let's find something they're allowing. Okay. Look at number six. Coming from anywhere. <coughs> the destination of 10, 10, 10, 0. But these, their numbers suck. They're both private. But we're assuming that's, that's correct. Anyone have a clue what that greater than 1023 means? I doubt you do. What that means is that's a reply to traffic. For instance, if I contact Google, if I send a report, a request out on port 80 to Google, the reply from Google will come in on a port greater than 1023, some random port number. So that's, that's traffic. Number seven is email. Number 23 is telling that. So yeah, those are okay, but they're not the best set of rules. Okay. Content filters, is there a software filter, not a firewall? And you can use it to restrict content. Okay. Yeah, we talked about the boobs already on there. So, <laughs> set of scripts or programs restricting your access to certain protocols. Primary purpose is to restrict internal access to external material. Real estate, we don't block anything here because we have a health sciences department. Can you imagine blocking something that students need access to? It won't work so well. Okay, protecting remote connections. Uh, now that we're going to start talking about VPNs, let me give an example of what a VPN is. We have a Rose State office on Tinker. I don't know if you all are aware of that. It's a small office. I think two people work there to help the military people enroll in classes. Years ago, that built that room had a dedicated connection from Tinker Air Force Base to Rose State. Probably paid five hundred bucks a month for that connection. Now they're paying hundred dollars a month. Because now what they are now they just have a regular internet connection like you have at your house. Then they're using what's called a VPN, a virtual private network connected to Rose State. What it means you can take an untrusted network to make it secure. So I can connect from my house into Rose State's network with with a VPN. And then access internal resources. Saves tons of money. I had to set up a VPN between the Oklahoma Tower, which is up on Northwest Expressway in between May and Penn, I had to set it up from there to Edmond, then also there to Dallas. It was funny. They, they asked me, what do I charge? I said, 600 bits, $600 a connection to set it up. Because back then, it was very complicated to set up. So I got into the Oklahoma Tower's network, and I configured the connection between there and Edmond. I don't know. It took me a couple days to do it. Made 600 bucks. And the guy's like, you're charging me 600 bucks and it only took you a couple days? I said, yeah, I mean, you don't know how to do it. So they're like, you know what? I think we can figure the second one out ourselves. I said, fine. You do the second one yourself. So in the meantime, what I had done was when I made the first one, I actually made a script. Because I made a, a set of commands to do it. So about a week later, they call me up, Ken, we can't figure it out. I said, obviously, that's why you paid me. And I'm like, what are you going to charge us to connect from the Oklahoma Tower to Dallas? Price hasn't changed, 600 bucks. I'm like, seriously? I said, yes. So I said, okay, do it. So I went into my script. I changed where it said admin, replaced it with the word Dallas, and hit enter as they go. 20 minutes later, I said, $600, please. And they're like, what? I wrote the script. You didn't. And they were not happy, but they paid the 600 bucks. So it was, uh, again, that, that's how you make money in this kind of stuff. So it was 
And they've actually called me many times since then, so they were still happy with their job. It worked. So, do you, do, do you like run your own business? When you I do? did for years. I ran you it. it kind of? Actually, I never promoted one bit. I never marketed it. I never advertised. I never promoted. It was just word of mouth. Everybody was. I used to take care of the the, the Cox Convention Center. He's take care of their entire network and the Ford Center and all that stuff. I, I, I guess it's now Chesapeake Arena. They probably just kind of look back and see your experience. On yeah. That. Well, the way I, like St. Philip Neri School up here on Key and Fifteenth Street. I don't know if you ever seen it. If you go Fifteenth. There's a school on the right hand side. Well, one of our students took care of their network. He did the work. But the company he worked for, kind of, they were the one who were hired by the school, but then they kind of subcontracted out to work to this student. Well, the company didn't want to do it anymore, but he wanted to do the work. So he says, Ken, you want to take over this business? So I got the contract with St. Philip Neri School that I hired the same student to do it. So I was collecting money without having to do anything. The student was doing it, so I just paid him. Well, it turns out the principal of the school, her husband worked at the Myriad at the time. Now it's called the Cox Convention Center. So he hired me. And then it, it's, it just goes. One, and a friend of mine wanted to start up a, uh, a uh, corporation to do web hosting and everything, and web development. So they asked me if I want to get involved. So I said, sure. We literally were in business for about a day and a half. We literally had a meeting. And we learned real quick that that ain't going to work. Well, they had a client, one client. Um, what's his last name? Don, I can't remember his last name. But I, he ran uh, Sergeant Grip Marine Specialties. And I emailed him and I said, hey, I'll do your website. 500 bucks. And he literally almost didn't sign up with me. He says, you know, I really want to get this done. But I can only afford 100 bucks. How about 100 bucks a month for five months? I'm like, okay. His first web page that they actually designed was literally a PowerPoint slide converted to a graphic and put on the internet. So I redid his website, charged him 500 bucks, and I will tell you, about two years ago, he made a little over $9 million. And I, I took care of his stuff for years and years and years and years. And he would call me and say, Ken, I got a $100 order. Then he'd be like, Ken, I got a $300 order. Ken, I got a $1,000 order. Ken, I made a million dollars this year. I mean, all over the internet. He sold everything from T-shirts to bumper stickers to caskets for the Marines. But no, I just, the word got out, and I took care of all these title companies and everything. It's got the point where I needed a vacation. So then I sold it all. But I never got my money back either. I sold it to a guy who never paid me, so that sucks. But, oh, well. But, uh. It's remote access, many different ways to do it. Y'all heard of War Dallas. Y'all seen uh, War Games? Anyone, has anyone seen War Games in here? Matthew Broderick, years ago with Whopper, and you want to play tic-tac-toe? Okay, you need to watch that movie. It's like a seminal movie in cybersecurity. Seminal means you really need to watch it. It's, one of the begin it's called War Games. That's where he does war dialing, where he just dials random numbers and Connects to computers and hey, you want to play a game? Let's play Global Plumeral Nuclear War. And yeah, it's pretty funny. But uh, yeah, war dialing, radius servers, there's all kinds of different things you can get remote access with. Um, Tacus servers, just tons of them. I'm not going to go into the details here because we're running out of time. Kerberos, Kerberos is how we do authentication. Kerberos is actually a three headed dog, and that's actually what we use today. Kerberos was really brought on by Unix Linux before Windows. But it is used. It has a ticket granting server. Basically, I connect in the morning. It gives me a ticket. Anytime I access anything on the network, it keeps, hey, do you got a ticket? And it keeps verifying my ticket. And it works actually quite well. And there are vulnerabilities in there, which I'll tell you about someday, which I don't have time today. Sesame, used in Europe. But not, I don't know much about it. I don't even think it's used anymore. Okay. VPNs allow us to connect into a secure network from an unsecured network. There's really two different modes, which they should tell us about. Transport mode and tunnel mode. Transport mode. So I see a whole bunch of trucks leaving. I don't know what's in them, but I know where they're going. They're going from point A to point B. Something happening. I don't know what's in it, but I see there's something happening. Tunnel mode. I see a tunnel between A and B. I don't have a clue what's happening. I don't know if there's any data going through or not. The VPNs, when I set up a Chapel Supplies Network from Oklahoma City to, to uh, Fort Worth, 
I set up a VPN, and man, that thing was amazing. They used that. I, the, actually, actually, no, they just got rid of it because they had just sold their Dallas company, the Fort Worth company. But yeah, they probably were using that for 15 years. It allows you to connect through on the internet to have a secure network, so it works really, really good. There's tunnel mode, which I just kind of mentioned. Okay. All right, that is the end of that. So I'm going to stop this, and then I'm going to talk about your homework real quick.